Good morning, everyone. You're well behaved this morning. I can put up this scripture, please. Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 14. So this psalm is remembering what we've been looking at actually for many months, God looking after his people in the wilderness, in the desert. So he guided them with the cloud by day and with light from the fire at night. He was always there looking after them. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the wilderness against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God. They said, can God really spread a table in the wilderness? Just one more verse. True, he struck the rock and water gushed out. Streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us bread? Can he supply meat for his people? What God's people were doing here, they were limiting God to only being able to do certain things. They said, true, he stopped us dying of thirst. Yeah? Yeah? He's kept us alive. Because you can go a long time without food, but you can't go very long without water. Not in a desert. Hardly any time at all, actually. And so they say, yeah, we know God's done some stuff, but he can't really give us food in the wilderness, can he? Yeah, God can keep you alive this morning, but he can't really give you an abundant supply of everything you need and meet all your needs, can he? He's not that good, is he? I mean, he's all right. Don't get me wrong. He's kept me alive. I'm not dead yet. I'm, I'm just about making it in the desert. And, and I do recognize I've got faith. Hear me out. I understand. He gave me some water. I'm not knocking him. But, you know, he can't really supply, spread a... T go, to, go back to verse 19. He can't really spread a table in the wilderness, can he? He can't really provide a banquet feast, can he, in the middle of a desert? Because the logistics of that are just impossible. For a million people, he can't really give us, like, you know, chicken and sausage rolls, whatever. <laughs> they, they didn't eat sausage rolls in Israel. They don't eat pork. You know, it's like, okay, he can give us, you know, a bit of water. He can keep us alive. What did Jesus do when he took the, the multitude into the wilderness? Gave them more than they could eat. Bread and fish. More than they could eat. And even the disciples said, well, where are we going to get that food from? Where this morning are you going to get what you need from God? I don't know why you're looking at me. <laughs> I can't give it to you. Can God provide a banquet? We're going to look at that this morning and next week. Can God provide a feast? Can God take us to his table? Can he provide, this is the question they're asking, can he provide a table in the wilderness? Can God supply more than we can actually cope with? Well, he did. He did for the Israelites, and Jesus did for those who came to him in the wilderness, into the barren place. He fed them. Yeah, but will he do it for you? Don't put God to the test. God's never stopped doing this. God doesn't just keep you alive. He feeds us. We are coming to his table this morning. He's going to give us the bread and the wine. He's going to supply the needs. 
Don't limit and test God by saying, well, church might be all right today and I might just stay alive and keep my faith through a bit longer. That isn't what God wants to do at all. God wants to give you the abundant feast of his banquet that Jesus Christ has invited you to. We're here to celebrate that. That's why we take communion every week, to remind us of that fact. So you, this morning, have come to a table in the wilderness. Because this world's a desert. It saps your strength. It sucks the life out of you. It dries you up. It shrivels you down. You wonder how long you can go. Can I go another day? Can I go another week? What about the government? What about the economy? What about this? What about that? Come to the table in the wilderness. God is going to sustain you, feed you, provide for you, give you more than you could ever dream of in Christ. Come on then, let's stand up in the presence of the Lord. You've come to the table of the king this morning. We need to give him thanks. We need to give him praise. We need to give him honor. We need to lift up our hearts to him and give him our worship. He deserves it. He's going to lavish his love upon us. He's going to give us to feast from the abundance of what he has achieved for us in Christ, which is all things. Let's look to the Lord right now. Father, thank you that Jesus Christ is seated at your right hand, at your table, on your throne. Everything is beneath him. He has all power and all authority. And this morning, we bow at his feet. We worship him. We praise him. We lift up his name. And we will receive the blessing of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Because we have come to our God and our King. So, Lord, bestow your bounty upon us this morning as we worship you, as we praise you, as we thank you, and give you all the honor as we lift up the name of Jesus. And all glory goes to you in his name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Thank you, team. Okay, the rest of us, we're going to gather around God's word right now. Let us go to the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's Song of Songs, chapter 2 and verse 4. Song of Songs, chapter 2 and verse 4. Very famous phrase, a lot of praise songs use this phrase. Let him lead me to the banquet hall, and let his banner over me be love. Let's put it in the King James. I like, I like the more poetic version, the more poetic way that this is phrased in the King James. He's brought me to his banqueting house and his banner over me was love. That's a better version, isn't it? It's more emphatic, past tense, makes it clearer, which is what it is in the original language. But there's two things happening here. There's the bride saying to the bridegroom, let him lead me to his banqueting table, his banqueting house. And you've got the bridegroom bringing her to the banqueting house. And the banner, at a wedding you would have a banner, you would have a declaration of what's happening, Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so, congratulations. But the banner is love. The banner over me is love. God's banner over you is love. I mean, there's lots of things God is, but preeminently his declaration of himself is love. God is love. And what I want us to look at today in God's word, and also we're going to look at this next week, is what is this banqueting table? If God is bringing you to a banqueting table, if God is bringing you to this place where you can have a banquet, we looked at it at, at the introduction before our worship. We, we looked at spreading a table in the wilderness. Can God give you a banquet? Let him lead me to this banquet. Do you, th do you think you can go? Yes, 
when do you go? If I said to you, I'm having a party, do you want to come? I don't, I'm not, it's hypothetical. <laughs> I'm not having one and you're not invited. Uh, some of you might, a bit at a time, I don't want you all turning up. I'm not the Lord. You might say yes, but you would probably ask, when? <laughs> no more than me, Dennis. There's several answers coming in that they're not wrong. Right, has he brought you to his banqueting table? Is he bringing you to his banqueting table? Are you coming to his banqueting table? What is the banqueting table? When is it? How do we get there? All the aspects you would question about what's actually happening. Some of you may have saw me just rush out of the meeting uh, because uh, Pastor Philip Asimo was just calling me because he's hoping to come to tonight's meeting. So we're looking forward to that because his sons just got married uh, in Leeds and he was driving up from London. And like everyone in London, he doesn't really understand where any other part of the country is. <laughs> so he was saying, I'm, I'm going to Leeds and then I'm driving back from Leeds from the, from the wedding feast because he's Ghanaian, and Ga he, apparently they have three weddings. I don't know if we've got any Ghanaians here. I've got some, some people whose motherland is Africa, and so they have a, the official uh, traditional ceremony, and then they have a, a British ceremony, and then they have a, a blessing ceremony. I mean, I've had enough after one wedding, have you? <laughs> and so he, he was... I, I, we were invited to this wedding, actually, but because we've had guests this week, we couldn't attend. Um, and so he was, he was, he's traveling home and he says, I'll see you next week because we, we're ministering together at a church, um, a conference in America. And I said, well, if you're traveling from Leeds to London, you're driving through our town. And he went, really? I goes, yes, look on a map. You are driving right through our town. He goes, oh, I says, when are you, when are you going? Oh, Sunday afternoon. I says, well you can come and preach for us then Sunday night. <laughs> we don't want to miss an opportunity of a man of God imparting something to us. And so I had to rush out to discuss when he's coming and what, when we're going to feed him. As he had some lunch, is he going to have some supper? You need to know when. You need to know where. You need to know how. You need to know lots of things about before, before you just go, you need to know what's going on. Is it a wedding? Is it a wedding banquet? Because it's a little bit different, isn't it, to just going round for lunch? Because you've got to dress nice. Yeah. Like some of you, well. <laughs> you'd, you'd put something, you know, a bit nicer on, wouldn't you? If it was a wedding. Yeah, all these issues. And so, have you noticed in the Bible that most things seem to revolve around a banquet. You ever notice that? Now, th this Greek word diepnon, that we sometimes translate supper, it's actually translated banquet, supper, feast, meal, dinner. It's translated lots of different ways in the New Testament, but it's the same principle. It's people gathering around a celebratory meal. And that was the, the pinnacle of hospitality and togetherness in antiquity, but certainly in, in the Bible. If you wanted to um, ratify a covenant, you'd do it around a meal. We do it today, don't we? If you have a wedding, you know, you, anyone can come to the wedding, but not everyone can come to the reception, can they? Yeah, the, the meal, that's the, that's the more intimate, the banquet, the, the, the wedding feast, the celebration of what's actually going on. The banquet is, is the pinnacle of that, isn't it? You know, if, if, if the king or the queen invites you 
to Buckingham Palace, you'd think, that's nice, I'm, I'm well thought of. But if they, if they invited you round to supper, you're in the inner circle. I'm just nipping, I'm just nipping to, the, to the kings for a, a sandwich with King Charles. You think, what? It's, it's, it's more than that. Go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. Something we read, you know, every week or so here. Because we celebrate the Lord's Supper every single week, as, as the Lord directed us. So as they were eating... Right? Well, uh, uh, supper, feast, banquet, and this is Passover, so it's one of the main meals of the year. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, broke it. Let's go back into the uh, modern version. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Let's read down a few verses. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. Notice he's giving it to them. Right? He's making the point of saying, you are invited. I'm giving you my food, my body, my drink. I'm giving it to you. You're not just invited. The host is making a point of identifying you as the honored guest. Drink from it, all of you. You're all invited. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, now, this is a really important bit. It's not just the bread and the wine. It's everything Jesus is saying. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So what's Jesus saying? Well, first of all, he's explaining to them what this supper, this feast, this banquet is. And we should all understand this now, because we do this every week. We take bread and wine. We come to the Lord's Supper. Diepnon, the, the feast, the banquet, the, the meal of God. So... Hopefully we grasp that, and we're going to do that again today. We're going to gather around today and celebrate the Lord's Supper. So this, this, this feast, this banquet, it's something that's already happened. Yeah, it happened. 2,000 years ago, Jesus instituted it. But it's the Passover, so it was instituted 1,000 years before that. And if you, if you follow the Bible, it goes right back to the beginning, even back to Genesis in the time of Abraham. Melchizedek, God's high priest, the king of Jerusalem, the, the, the priest of El Elyon, God most high. It goes right back to the beginning of the Bible. The blessing of God is contained in this meal. That all happened. But Jesus is saying, I'm not going to eat it again until the Father's kingdom. So in other words, there's another one coming. Yeah? Jesus says so, but not only does he say so, the Bible tells us about it. So if we jump to the end of the Bible, if we jump to Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6, here's what we find. Then I heard what sound, so this is the, the end of the age, the end of time as we know it, before the, the new kingdom comes. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. There's a praise party in heaven. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. So there's a wedding. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear, for linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So the bride is God's people, the saints. Yeah? The angel said to me, write this down. Some of you write down when I preach. I notice you're writing down, which always blesses me because I don't write stuff down. 
So you must know more than me now because you've got it written down. Write it down. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, and write this as well, this is the true word of God. This is true. This is not a picture, an image, a parable. No, there's going to be another banquet. It's that word, supper. Yep, not in Greek, but it can be translated banquet, feast, can be translated lots of different ways, and it is in the Bible. But it's the same principle. So there's going to be this huge celebration, and the people there are the ones who are going to be blessed, and the people there are the ones who've been invited. So you've got Jesus at the supper, giving the bread and the wine, at the celebration Passover meal with his disciples. And isn't it interesting, we call that the Last Supper. And it's not. It's the First Supper. Yeah? This is the Last Supper in the Bible. So you've got, you've got Jesus giving that past. You've got this big one, future coming. But what about in the meantime? What do we do? Do we remember the good meal and the good things God did? And then one day we hope that the, all these good things will happen again. No, that's not what we're instructed to do at all. What we're instructed to do now is come to God's table now. Jesus says, whenever you meet together, do this in remembrance of me. And so... We are at the feast in the middle. We're at God's banquet now. We're remembering what Jesus did. We're looking forward to the banquet feast that's to come. But we're at a banquet feast now. Why have you come to church? Sing songs to hear a sermon to dump the kids in kids' church for an hour so I get some rest. You might have lots of things in your head as to why you're coming to church this morning. You've come to a banquet. You've come to God's table. And for hundreds of years in the original church, their focus was always the communion, the breaking of bread, the koinonia, the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving service. And you'll read that when the instructions are given to churches, they talk about their meetings as when you are breaking bread together, when you are at the Lord's table together, when you're remembering the Lord's supper, because in their mind, that was the focus of everything God was doing. It doesn't say when you come to listen to the pastor preach. It doesn't say when you come to sing a song. It's when you come to remember the Lord at the breaking of bread. That's always the central focus. The meal, the banquet, we are at the banquet in the middle. From what was, to what is soon to come, to what is happening now. And so this morning, we are going to look at that, and hopefully we're going to appropriate that, assimilate that, and get that into our spirits, so that we don't just think it's good things from God that are going to come, and it's good things in the past that God did, but it's the wonderful things God wants to do now. We're going to look at that. The banquet in the middle. Go to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church because they'd forgot this. Many Christians have forgot this. Many churches have forgot this. Many churches don't even do this anymore because they don't understand what it is. They come, they sing nice songs, they have flashing lights, they have a smoke machine, they have people jumping up and down and waving flags and everyone's enjoying themselves, but they don't break bread. So they've removed the meal. Imagine going to a wedding reception and there's no food. 
I mean, once again, hypothetically, if I invited you round to my house for supper, I think we're going to have a Chinese meal tonight, darling, aren't we? Because we've got Philip coming. Isaac likes Chinese. Isaac will do anything for the Chinese. Come on, Chinese. Imagine if, I, if you came round and I says, okay, let's sit round the table. Right, everybody just jump up and down, wave a flag. You know, sing, enjoy yourself. Let's have a chat. Let me preach to you for an hour. <laughs> You'd be really happy, wouldn't you, if I did that? <laughs> All the time you'd be thinking, what are we having for dinner? Is it gluten-free? <laughs> Is it vegan? I mean, these days, it's, it's, you know, you don't know what to give people, do you? Well, I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I don't know. Here's some water, then. <laughs> do you want ice in it? No, the focus would be the meal. And let, let's be honest, that's probably why you're coming. If I says, let's go out for a meal, your first question is, where are we going? What are we having? Because I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I don't like, oh, oh no, that's, oh, no, I'm a bit more upper class than that. We went for a nice meal in York the other day, didn't we? Mark and Debbie recommended this French restaurant to us. I weren't so sure about, you know, French. I like French food, I just don't like the service. You know, because if you ask questions, you know, French people can be very direct, can't they? You know, can I have chips with this? No, you cannot. Get out of my restaurant. <laughs> it says carrots. When you come together, is it not the Lord's Supper, the feast, the dinner, the celebration that you eat? Well, is it? Is it? Or is it just a religious thing we do, and actually we get less out of that than anything else? It's like, oh yeah, we do this because it's religious. But for me, it's the singing, and it's the, it's the preaching, and it's whatever. No. You're coming to the Lord's table. You're coming to his banquet. You're coming to the food that is God himself. Jesus is saying, I'm giving you me. Eternal life. Jesus' body is alive forever. Forgiveness of sins. I'm giving you my food. Like he did with the Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness. Is it not the Lord's supper that you're eating? When you are eating, some of you go ahead as uh, with your own private suppers. It's also, it's almost as though some people come to church, it's like when they go home and they're having a sandwich, they're really just focused on satisfying themselves. I want something to eat, give me something that satisfies, I need this, I need that, I want the preaching to be like this, I want the songs to be like this, I want church to be like this, I want everything to revolve around my appetite. Paul's rebuking the church, saying no. You're coming to the Lord, he's giving you his food. You eat it and you're thankful because it's God who's going to satisfy you. It's not the other stuff. It's God himself. As a result, one person remains hungry and another one gets drunk. You see, when you focus on your own satisfaction, when you focus on what you think you're getting out of it, you'll have a whole host of different opinions as to whether it was a good meeting or not. How many of you assess the meeting today? Preaching were good today. Weren't the worship, weren't the music wonderful? Didn't like that new chorus though. It's funny how you never like new choruses. <laughs> Till you've sung them a few times, then they're your favourite. People are very fickle, aren't they? Isn't it funny how you don't like a message or a, a, a word or someone's teaching or preaching because they said something you didn't like or, or they touched on a topic that's your pet hobby horse that you have a different way of looking at that. This is what they're doing. Someone's going away hungry. Oh, I, I didn't get what I wanted today. Or someone else has got drunk. Isn't it amazing how God can touch some people so that they just fold with the spirit and God touches them and then other people, you know, get out as quick as they can so no one can see them going. Because they didn't like that guest speaker. That's not why we're here. You're here to meet with God. 
Not assess what, all the food and how everyone's reacting and how they're eating and how they're drinking and what they're doing. That's not why you're here. I know that's what you do when you go to someone's house for a meal. Well, on your way home in the car, you discuss what you did like and what you didn't like, don't you? Oh, weren't that nice? Oh, I didn't like that, though. That's what you do. Stop it. I know what you like. That's what you do when you go out for a meal. Oh, I like them. I like that. I didn't like that. You assess it. Let's read down. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Do you despise the church of God by humiliate, humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul reiterates word for word what Jesus said. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. By the way, have you noticed that's in speech marks? Paul's writing to the Corinthian church a couple of decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So when you see people on TV saying the Bible wasn't written till hundreds of years after Jesus, Paul's already quoting it a few years later, word for word. So it had to have been written very quickly after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Proof, because you've got quotes word for word in other manuscripts. You can't quote something unless it already exists. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we are taking the communion, we're remembering the banquet Jesus gave us, and we're proclaiming Jesus until the next banquet. We're at the banquet in the middle. We're at the supper now. We're not waiting for it to come, although we are, the great wedding supper of the Lamb. We're not just remembering something that happened. We're participating in a present living reality of eating with God now. You're invited to God's house for supper. I'd expect a bit of a better response than that, to be honest. I'm not inviting you around to my house for supper if that's, that's the response you get when God invites you around to it. God's invited you to his house for supper. All right, then you're all right. Well, I'll check what's in my diary. <laughs> well, what else you got on? Isn't it funny how people have excuses not to come to the Lord's supper? My excuse not to go somewhere else is that I'm at, I'm at the Lord's supper. When people invite me to something else, I'm saying, well, I'm at the Lord's supper on that day. I mean, I love you, and I'd like to come round for lunch, but actually, God's invited me round to his house. So on the pecking order, you're a bit below him. Is it the Lord's Supper? Is it the Lord's banquet? Is it the Lord's feast? Why would you rather eat at someone else's house instead of here? Doesn't mean you can't eat at someone else's house. But just have a bit of a priority. I've got priorities of people I like, you know. Yes, yes, I have. I know you all think I'm your favourite and you're my favourite. Well, I've got a list. You will, you'll never see it. <laughs> Can't go to everyone's house. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Why is it Christians assess the supper rather than themselves? How many people assess the church? God's saying, no, this is my supper. You assess yourself. Are you right with me? Stop judging how other people are eating and what you think the meal's like. Are you judging yourself or are you judging God's supper? Do we really want to assess this? Really? You want to assess the perfect, beautiful body of Christ. You want to assess his precious blood according to your standard. Because that's what the church is, the body of Christ. Very dangerous to do that. So we're at the feast in the middle. We're at the banquet now. So the table of the Lord at Passover 2,000 years ago, Jesus 
institutes the new covenant. This is my body, this is my blood. This is my bread, this is my wine. Jesus institutes it. At the supper that is to come, the banquet that is to come, the father lays on the wedding banquet for his son. So you've got the Lord's Supper instituted by Jesus. You've got the final banquet that is coming that is going to be laid upon by God the Father because Jesus says that banquet is like a wedding banquet that a father put on for his son. So if you've got Jesus at the beginning and if you've got Father God at the end, guess who we've got in the middle? The Holy Spirit, the Trinity. So when they met together in the upper room at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. We're at the banquet in the middle. The Holy Spirit's here. Notice the banquets were on set festival feast days. Passover, the banquet, the meal, where the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus inaugurates. That's the first feasts in the spring, the Moedim, the festivals of God. The next feast was Pentecost, Shavuot, harvest. The Holy Spirit turns up. But there's final feast to come, tabernacles, which is a family celebration for all nations where everyone lives in tabernacles, Sukkot, tents, that the Father's going to lavish when Jesus returns. So we're at the feast in the middle. The Holy Spirit's here. Jesus says, whenever you gather two or three in the midst, there I am. Because Jesus is one with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is here. God is here at his feast. He's putting on a feast this morning. Are you going to eat? Or are we going to assess it like the Corinthians did? Why don't we just eat? Why don't we just do what Jesus has commanded us to do, what the apostles telling the church to do, all the way through the Bible, and there's hundreds of examples of this that we tend to overlook, but I just want to run through a summary of aspects of this feast, because you are very privileged this morning, we all are, to be at God's special feast. You should always be privileged when anyone invites you to a wedding, when anyone invites you to a meal. You should be thankful that they've thought of you. Okay, first thing then, Matthew 22, verse 1. Jesus, in the Gospels, I'll look at the Gospels. Jesus talked about this feast throughout the Gospels. You know this, but let's just try and pull some of them together about this banquet, this feast. Jesus spoke to them again in parables. His parables talked about this a lot. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. So it's not just a banquet, it's a wedding banquet. It's the, it's the most lavish of all banquets. Okay, let's just read down. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet. It's the banquet we're looking at. To tell them to come, but they refused to come. So let's just stop there. First aspect of this banquet. You've been invited I mean, just that alone, just think about that alone. Why have you been invited? Because you're special. No, you're not. Why have you been invited? There is no reason on earth why I can think God invited me to his wedding banquet. I mean, I might think I look all right, but I'm not, I'm not Gabriel, am I? I'm not the Archangel Michael. I could list a thousand reasons why I shouldn't be there. God's invited you to his wedding banquet. Oh, the wedding banquet to come. No, the wedding banquet now. The banquet now was, is, is to come. Your invitation's now. Your invitation is to the, the wedding supper now. We know there's a great one to come, 
but it's happening right now. The bread and wine is what we're doing right now. Do you want to be here? Have you come? There's some people haven't come. Why? They've got something better to be doing, in their opinion. What a crazy thought. How can you have something more important than this? Feasting with God. How can you have something more important than coming to God's table? How can you have more? Now, if church is just, well, you're just singing songs and listening to Dave and he just says the same thing over and over again. Well, I can understand why you don't come. If it's, oh, well, it's church and I don't really like everybody there and I don't really get anything from it and I'm not really sure about what's going on, then I can understand why you don't come. But that's not what church is. Church is the supper of God. Church is the feast banquet of God. And it's now. It's the banquet in the middle. So he sent some more servants and tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fat and cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. Everything is ready. Not will be. When the great banquet comes, it says the bride has made herself ready. She's already ready. How's she already ready? Because she's ready now. If you're ready now, you're ready. You're ready. Come to the banquet. Have you accepted the invitation? Well, you lot have because you're here. But not everybody has. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about unbelievers, people who reject God. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who say they're Christians but don't want to come. Really? I mean, when I got married, Pastor John, you invited everybody, didn't you? He did. All the church. And I'd not been in church long, so half the people there, I didn't know they were. So I didn't really know if someone had been invited and they didn't come. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't really care. I weren't really that bothered. I were only interested in Carolyn. It's like everyone else. It's like, I can't wait till this is over and we can go on honeymoon, to be honest. <laughs> come to the... Come. Come, but... Some people, they don't. Let's read down. But they paid no attention. Why is it some people don't even listen? And I'm talking about Christians. Are you coming to church on Sunday? Oh, no, nah, I've got something better to do. Read really? what? And I don't mean you're on holiday or you've got to. I don't mean genuine things you can't help. But they paid no attention. One went off to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, ill-treated them, and killed them. I remember being in this church, and I saw someone walking past who had not been to church for a few weeks. I just says, "Hey, you all right? I haven't seen you for a few weeks. You coming to church next week? They turned to me and says, Is that all that's got to talk about? Trying to get me in church? I thought I were inviting you to a meal. It's not all about church, you know. Uh, it, it is. It is, because that's God's wedding supper. That's where God meets with his people. No one's saying you can't meet with God on your own. Of course you can. But that's not the wedding banquet. The wedding banquet's where the bride is. The bride's the church. Got angry with them. You ever notice some people, you invite an atheist or someone at work who's, you know, an unbeliever to church and they'll probably go, no, they don't want to come. But they might be all right with you. You invite a backslidden Christian back to church. <laughs> you hypocrites. I came to that church once. And you know what they did to me? And when you listen, they didn't do anything to you. They probably just didn't do something that you wanted them to do. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. When you look at the end banquet in Revelation 19, when God puts on the banquet for his people, he's also bringing judgment on the world. The banquet is the safe place. 
Because the banquet is where you drink the wine and your sins are forgiven. So in other words, God's not going to judge you and condemn you. If you're not at the banquet, you're under condemnation. If you're not drinking the wine, you don't have forgiveness of sins. Because Jesus says, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. If you're not doing that, your sins aren't forgiven. By your choice. So the judgment of God comes. A couple more verses. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is still ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come. Understand, if you reject God, God will still have a seat at that table that should have been yours that will be replaced by someone else. God will invite someone else. God's actually inviting everyone. I remember when we were going to America a few years ago and we were taking Jemima with us uh, as a treat and, and we'd, we'd put on some special events in America. We were really looking forward to taking her to meet all our friends and we were going to treat her we were going to take her to an NFL game and uh, because she used to like the NFL then she's gone off it now and and the night we were to fly we were at the airport hotel where Jemima started being ill now you need to understand something about Jemima when you when you're a bit ill you're ill you might be sick and ill for a day and then you get over it. When Jemima gets ill, you know she's going to be ill for a week. And so Carolyn's like trying to tell her how to behave. Look, we'll just walk through, we'll just walk through security. <clears throat> <clears throat> just don't be sick, because she were being sick every 10 minutes. You know, we'll put a bag over your head or something. Just pretend you're not ill. I mean, Carolyn, that is not going to work. And we literally, we had to leave her at the, the airport hotel and Pastor John came and got her and we were getting on the plane and we didn't even know where Jemima was. She was still in the hotel. We checked she was safe. And so we got on the plane and we're flying to America and Carolyn's crying all the way through. Oh, we were so looking forward to taking Jemima and we would, you know. And then the seat that we booked for Jemima at the side of us, the airline gave to someone else. So Carolyn sat a ball in her eyes out. Every time she looked at this seat, <laughs> not only was Jemima not there, there was someone else in it. <laughs> do you know what? The air airline is allowed to do that. It's their plane. If there's no one takes that seat, they can give it to someone else. You have a seat at the table. Don't you give that seat up for some... God's picked you. Now, he's invited everyone else. I know we're messing with God's omniscience here and we predestination and we can't fathom it all out. But don't give your seat to something else. You take it. Jesus purchased the ticket and the price and the seat for you. Make sure you're there. What? At the end of time? No, now. Now, at the banquet in the middle, accept the invitation. Go to the street corners. Invite to the banquet. Jesus is talking about the meal, the supper. He's talking about what we're doing now. Not just at the end, what we're doing in the middle. Invite anyone you can find. You see, Jesus came to the Jews, and the Jews should have received him as their Messiah. Some of them did. Most of them rejected it. So do you know what God's done? He's invited you. You're in someone else's seat. Well, think about it. Why would you have been invited? Jesus was a Jew. He came to save the Jews. He was the king of the Jews. God knows he's going to save the world, but the, the principle was the salvation of Israel. And God's saying, well, they've rejected it, so I'm going to invite everyone. We've got lots of nations here. You're all invited. God says so. Invite anyone you find. Some of you, you're only here because someone was just walking down the street and they were bored, so they talked to you about Jesus. And you thought, oh, okay, I'll try that. Through God's predestination plan, he's always planned for you to be here. But I look back on how I got saved, and I think it's an absolute miracle how I got saved. I never went to church. I knew nothing. Someone in my class just at school when I was a teenager just happened to talk about Jesus. And I was like, what's this? 
It's like some of you overhearing when I'm inviting someone around for supper and you're like, can I come? I'm like, mm, go on then. Invite anyone. You're invited to this meal. You're invited to this banquet. You have a seat at this banquet. One more verse. They'll just look at how Luke described it. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. Remember, you're here by grace. Some of you are bad. Some of you are better than others. That's not why you're here. You're here because Jesus has invited you to the banquet. Now, he's going to make you good. Don't misunderstand that. But he wants everyone in. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So the banquet hall is filled. Heaven is going to be full. You do know that. Don't believe the lies of the media. There are more Christians today than there's ever been. There's more churches today than there's ever been. There's more people believing in Jesus today than at any other day in history. It increases every single day. Look at Luke's version of it. Luke 14, verse 16. Luke 14, verse 16. Same parable, but slightly different emphasis. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet. It's the banquet again, and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Come. Next verse. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field, I must go and see it. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out, please excuse me. Another said, I've just got married so I can't come. You need to decide what are your legitimate excuses and what are illegitimate excuses for not being at God's banquet table. You've got to resolve that in your heart. Because if you don't, anything will be an excuse. And anything will be a legitimate excuse. Because you will think, well, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do this. And you'll, you'll not treat it like a banquet. You'll treat it like an option. You've got to decide that. Because those excuses seem pretty legitimate to me. You know, getting married seems a legitimate excuse. Having a business uh, to sort out seems an excuse. They seem legitimate excuses. So why does Jesus do this? Because he's purposely confronting us with the reality of what this is. It's the wedding banquet. It should be the most important thing in your life. It doesn't mean there can't be other things you have to do. Of course there are. But you know and God knows whether it's reality or it's just an excuse. And you can, you can kid other people, but you won't kid God and you, won't, you shouldn't be able to kid yourself. Let's not have excuses for not being at the banquet, okay? So you've been invited. Have you accepted? You've got to accept, haven't you? RSPV, or is it an RSVP? RSVP, that's it. Something in French, s'il vous plaît. Respondez, s'il vous plaît, is that what it is? There you go. You've accepted the invitation. Next thing then. Are you going to go? Oh, I've accepted the invitation. That doesn't mean you're going to go. Does it? I mean, I get invited to all kinds of stuff. And I'm always very, very cautious, you know, will you come and preach here? Will you come and do this? Will you come and do that? And I'll go, well, I'll see. Which is a nice way of saying, I don't really want to come, but if God tells me I've got to, I will. <laughs> it's amazing how many people think that means you've said yes. I didn't say yes. You said, you said you'd come. I said, I think about it. Have you come? You see, God's feast, the, the Moedim, the festivals, the appointed times, the, the holy convocations, translated lots of different ways. If you didn't attend them, 
in the Bible, you were cut off from your people. If you didn't attend Passover, they says, well, you're not, you're, not, you're not one of God's people then. Because that's, that's the confirmation that you belong to God. You know, if you, weren't, if you weren't at Passover, everyone had to be in Jerusalem at Passover. That's why all Jesus' apostles were there at the Last Supper, which isn't the Last Supper, it's the First Supper. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, which is the feast in the middle, we're at Pentecost, we're not at Tabernacles yet, the judgment of God hasn't come yet on the world, but it's coming. We're at the feast in the middle. If you weren't there on the day of Pentecost, do you think you could have said, well, I'll get the Holy Spirit the day after? Well, I'm not so sure, to be honest. You see, everyone in the church on the day of Pentecost was filled with the Holy Spirit. Everyone. And Peter, when, when he gave the sermon on the day of Pentecost, he said, be baptized and, you know, be sanctified to God and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. But there's, there's no real descriptions after to what happened. I, I hope most of them did re receive the Holy Spirit after that. But if, you sh if you'd been in church on the first day, you'd have got him. He'd have come. Too many Christians, they're, they're waiting for the leftovers. I mean, we have that Chinese tonight. I know where I'll be eating Monday. Because we always order too much. My Monday, my Monday meal will be warmed up Chinese. Which is fine, I quite like it. Don't just think, oh, well, I'll, I'll have this later. Get it now. Get the Holy Spirit now. Come to the banquet now. Come to Shavuot now. Come to the feast now. Come to the table now. Receive the Holy Spirit now. Don't put it off. We're coming to God's banqueting table now. The banner over us is love today. God loves you now. Do you, have you noticed God's not going to grow in love with you? You will grow in love with God because you'll find out more like what he's like. But God knows exactly what you're like. And while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Greater love has, has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. God already loves you eternally and perfectly. He can't love you more than he does now. Because if he did, he wouldn't be God. He'd be changing and he doesn't change. His love for you is infinite. Today. Today. He loves you as much today as he ever will. An eternal, unfathomable, unbreakable love. Don't just accept it. Come now. Matthew, go, to, go back to Matthew. Go to Matthew 11. Matthew 11 and verse 19. So they were invited. Jesus invited them all. He invited the whole Jewish nation. Did they come? No. Some of them did. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees didn't come because they had a religious interpretation of why they didn't have to come. Do you know you can invent religious reasoning as to why you don't need to be in church? Yes, you can. And you'll be able to back it up with some strange people on YouTube <laughs> who, will who will talk about the church and they don't even know what it is. The church is God's banquet. It's God's feast. It's his table. It's his supper. And the Pharisees were like, oh, well, we don't, oh, you know. We're not quite sure. We don't think we have to be at that. And by the way, Jesus is a bit, he's a bit extreme, isn't he? He's a glutton and a drunkard. Jesus' parties, they're a bit overkill, aren't they? They're a bit too much, aren't they? How, how many of you have heard that? Well, I, I believe in God, but, but are you happy clappers? <laughs> you're, you're a bit, you know, you jump up and down and you dance. Well, some of us do. You clap your hands. You know, a church is supposed to be boring, not happy. Everybody knows that. You know, no, we're all supposed to be like Arnold. <laughs> Full of the joy of God, praising God. You know, I know you British people, if you've raised your hand, I mean, dear me, that I'm over the moon. If you raise your hand, you're like on fire for God. 
He's raised his hand. He's overflowing in the spirit. Can't get any more than that. It's a bit extreme, isn't it? What, because Jesus is having Jesus is giving lots of bread and wine. Jesus always gives more than there is. When he took them out into the desert, there was more left over than there was at the beginning. When he changed the water into wine, there was more left over of wine than there was at the beginning. It's abundance. It's extravagance. He lavishes his grace upon you. It's like, well, I'll take a bit. No, don't take a bit. Have as much as you need. Don't dishonor God by making out his parties are stingy. I can guarantee if you come to my house for Chinese, there'll be more Chinese than you can eat. Because I don't want you going home saying, well, he didn't give us very much, did he? <laughs> and Carolyn will say, oh, that's a lot of food. I'm saying, don't matter. We'll eat it tomorrow, the leftovers. Just get, as, get more than we need. So they don't think I'm stingy. They know I'm a Yorkshireman, so I've got to break that stereotype. <laughs> more than you can eat. That's what Jesus did. But the ironic thing is, if you read the whole context... They didn't go to John the Baptist either. And John the Baptist had locusts for dinner. Right? They say, oh, Jesus is too much. It was like, well, you didn't go to John the Baptist either. And he went, I mean, that was the last meal you wanted to go to in the desert. Locusts and honey. Well, honey's not so bad. It didn't come in jars, you know. They didn't get a jar of honey off Tesco's here, spread that on your toast. It came out of a hive full of bees that stung you. If you wanted some honey, you had to, you had to go through some pain to get that honey because the bees weren't just going to let you take it. And as for locusts, forget it. I'm not trying locust. It's nice, it tastes like chicken. It doesn't, it tastes like dead insect. They didn't go to either feast. You know, oh, I don't want to do that. Well, go to, go to a monastery then and sit in quiet and chant, but you won't do that either. You're just making an excuse as why you don't go to God's banquet. It's got nothing to do with the type of church. You're just making excuses. You've got to attend. The prostitutes and tax collectors, oh, there's some right weirdos at that church. There is, you ought to come. <laughs> Tell me about it. That's what I say. You know, when I'm talking to someone and I tell them at the church, they'll always say, oh, that church, you know, can you remember so-and-so? And I just think, yep. <laughs> well, he was a right weirdo he was, wasn't he? I says, well, there's a lot more weirdos than him still here. <laughs> That's not an excuse telling me there's some strange people in church. I know there is. Dear me, do I know there is. Tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, yep. We've got the lot. But we're sinners saved by grace. There's good and bad. There's some people that trust with me life. There's some people I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect ever to see them again. I wouldn't be surprised if they never came again. Wouldn't surprise me in the, in the least. Some people that trust with me life. We've got everybody here because everyone's invited to the table. Come. So you've got to accept. You've got to attend. Yeah? You've got to accept. Accepting doesn't mean you're there. Attending means you're there. Next one, Luke 14, verse 8. Luke 14, verse 8. Aspects of the banquet. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, banquet, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. Let's go down. If so, the host who invited both, both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat, then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. One more verse. But when you were invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all other guests. You accept the invitation, you attend, and you have the right attitude. Your conduct. You are here.
to worship God. We're here to worship God in the humility of his presence. Don't assume that somehow you're better than others. Don't assume your prominence. Don't assume your position. Don't assume that you have a right to something above other people. Very, very dangerous thing to do. Lower yourself as a servant and God will lift you up. Humble yourselves under the hand of the Lord and he will lift you up. At the last supper, Jesus got off the table and washed everybody's feet. That wasn't his job. He's the Messiah. He's their Lord. At the very least, he's their rabbi, their teacher. We're here to serve. Let's serve one another. Let's not assume something's beneath our dignity. Now, we can't do everything. I can't do everything. None of us can. But we want God to honor us. We don't want to just be honoring ourselves. Make sure you take the right place at the banquet. And if you're not sure, just serve where you are and God will move you. Yeah? Right attitude, right conduct. You see, this wedding, this feast, is, it's, it's in a lot more than you think. We tell the stories of the lost things, the, 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 the story of the lost son, the prodigal son. You all know the story. It's all about a lost son. It's all about a banquet. It's about a banquet that the father throws and then one of the sons refuses to go because he had the wrong attitude. And the other son, who was the sinful son, he went because he had the right attitude. He says, Father, forgive me. I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of the hired servants. And God says, you're sitting next to me at, my ban at the banquet. And the other son says, I've been slaving around and I should be have more honor than this. I should be treated better than this. I should be exalted as your son. He would have been. He had the wrong attitude. The father would have had him a honored, a, a, an honored place at the table. Because he got the wrong attitude, he didn't even go to the feast. Be careful when you take offense at something and you stay away from a meeting or away from church and you miss out on the blessing God wanted to give you because you've got the wrong attitude about somebody else that's nothing to do with you anyway. Just be thankful you're at the banquet. Just be thankful you're a son. The correct attitude. Next one then, Luke chapter 7. I'll try and get through these quickly. Next week, we're going to look at a practical application of this. Now I'm just giving you the, the gospel examples of this. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have a dinner with him, a banquet, a meal, a supper. He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. There's a banquet put on, a religious banquet, because it's a Pharisee that's put it on. So it's strict, religious observance, proper sacraments, proper obedience to the Bible. Jesus is there, right? So it's a banquet that Jesus is at. But there's different people there. There's a Pharisee. I mean, there's other people there as well. There's a Pharisee. And then there's a woman who's led a sinful life. Now, some people say prostitute, but it just says she's led a sinful life, and it's a woman. Always a picture of the church. Which one are you? At the banquet, because Jesus is there. We know who Jesus is. Are you the religious person who never does anything wrong? Or are you the person who's led a sinful life? So she came with an alabaster jar of perfume. So she's brought something to the banquet. Not food. A jar of perfume. What's the Pharisee brought? Well, he's not brought any perfume. Let's read down. 
She stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. Just read down. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. What's he doing? He's doing what Paul was telling the Corinthian church off for. You're assessing what Jesus is doing and what other people are doing and interacting with Jesus. That is a recipe for disaster. Because she's worshipping Jesus. That's what the oil represents. That's what the perfume represents. That she's kissing his feet. Koinonia, uh, not koinonia, um, the, the, the word for worship in the Greek, it involves that, uh, that aspect of intimacy, kissing even. Proskuneo. And he said to her, Simon, I have something to tell you, which is strange because Simon means here. Shimon. You're not listening, Simon. Tell me, teacher, he said. Doesn't call him Lord, Master. He just calls him a teacher because he's, he's just assessing him. He's assessing what he's teaching. Two people owed uh, a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither, neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them loved him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Notice what Jesus is doing. He's meeting Simon where he is. Look, if you're going to judge this, let's have a proper judgment. Let's assess what's really going on here. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Well, of course he'd seen him because he's judging her. I came into your house. I came to your banquet. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my feet, but she has poured perfume on my hair. He's pointing out aspects of worship. All these are pictures of worship. At this banquet, this woman's worshipping me. Simon, you aren't. You may have accepted, you may have attended, that doesn't mean you're worshipping. Doesn't. Not necessarily. Our actions. Just read down. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. She didn't have a, even have a seat at the banquet, but she was at the feet of Jesus. She got the greatest blessing at the banquet because she worshipped the most. She loved the most. She knew she was a sinner. She knew she didn't come up to the standard of everyone else in that room. She didn't care. She knew Jesus would accept her, so she worshipped him and lavished her love upon him. And she was honoured at the banquet. We are here to worship God. Yeah? Go to Mark chapter 6, verse 20. Mark chapter 6, verse 20. So, aspects of the banquets as revealed in the Gospels. And this is one that's a little strange, but I want to throw it in there because it's mentioned throughout the Bible. Alternative banquets. King Herod through the best banquets in Israel. Yeah? Herod's banquet was a lot more lavish and spectacular with better food than Jesus' banquets in Israel. Who's Herod? The king of the Jews. But he's not the real king of the Jews. He's a false king of the Jews. But Herod throws banquets. Herod puts on lavish celebrationary feasts and meals. And now he's got John the Baptist there. So at Herod's banquet, there's a prophet there. Sounds a good church to belong to, doesn't it? 
We've got the greatest prophet in the world at this banquet. Because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man, when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Next verse. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials, military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee. At this banquet, all the inn people are there. You know, the cool people. If you don't know who's cool, ask your teenagers. Because you certainly aren't. The cool, you know, the Hollywood elite. The special people. You know, the, the, the George Clooney's, the Harry and Meghan's, the, you know, you wouldn't want to be at that banquet, would you? You know, all the important celebrities. Is it a good banquet to be at? Well, they've got John the Baptist there. Yeah. They've got the best music there. They've got the best dancing there. Got the best flags there. Got the best lights, the best smoke, the best building. Uh, this was in a palace. This is in Herod's palace. This is the kind of banquet you want to go to. Oh, but it's, it's not a proper banquet. It's the king of Israel. It's in the Holy Land. Herod went to the temple. Herod built the temple. Herod loved the religious community. But he wanted to control them. Herod's got the greatest prophet there. Yeah, but they're going to kill him. There are alternative churches to attend that put on better banquets, have better people, have better entertainment, have greater buildings, even have greater speakers there. But they'll actually kill the prophetic voice. They won't allow the prophetic voice to speak. John the Baptist will be killed at this banquet. If the prophetic voice tries to come through in that church, they'll kill it. They're not allowing God to really speak. They just want everything to look right, sound right, and establish their power base so they can, they can get more money and they can control more people. That's what Herod did. No intention. Letting the people live in the freedom of God. The people were there to, to worship him. When, they, when Herod heard the Messiah had been born, they, he killed the children. Wanted rid of God. They're going to kill John the Baptist. They want rid of him. Do you think the food was good at that banquet? I'm telling you now, that would have been the best food in the country. You'd have had the best cuisine, the best entertainment. What's entertainment got to do with the church of God? Nothing we do should revolve around the aspect of entertainment. It's always around the aspect of worshipping God. Yes, we praise God. Praise God. Yes, we want music to praise God. It's not entertainment. We're not spectators. We're, we're a congregation communing around the presence of God. We're here to worship God. The entire thing had just become warped. The entire religious system was warped. The Sadducees and all the chief priests, they were all in league with Herod. They hated Jesus. You've got a religious institution, the main religious institution in the country that was actually preaching against God. That had never happened, would it? You'd never have the main religious churches and institutions in our country denying the word of God, would you? They put on the best banquets. They've got the best cathedrals. They've got the best churches. They've got the best art. They've got the best everything. You really didn't want to be at that banquet. You'd be much better off. You know, when this banquet was happening, if you read that when they killed John the Baptist at that banquet, do you know where Jesus was? In the wilderness. It says he, he, he removed himself by boat to a quiet place. He went away into a desert region, a wilderness region. And that's the exact same time, that's when he fed the multitude. Which banquet would you rather be at? The best one in Israel or in a desert with Jesus? Because I'm telling you now, Jesus would have fed you better than he would. And there's no strings attached because Jesus would do the miracle and Jesus would heal everybody as well. 
And then he'd send them home and set them free. Didn't want to control them. He was the true king of Israel. He's the one who put on the best banquet. But today people flock to the religious houses of entertainment. It is an alternative to the genuine banquet. It will kill the prophetic. They won't allow prophecy to happen because it messes up with their entertainment schedule, their pre-programmed religious system that can't change even if the Holy Spirit turns up. He's removed. John chapter 2 then. Pull this together. And we'll just look at one more. And then we're going to gather around the bread and the wine. John chapter 2 verse 1. On the third day a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. To the banquet. They've been invited. They've accepted the invitation because they're there. They've got the right attitude because they sat quietly doing, the, they're not trying to control things. I mean, it would appear that most people don't even know Jesus is there. It's not his wedding. They've accepted, they've attended, they've got the right attitude. They've not gone to a, an alternative banquet. They've not gone to a false one. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. They're at a banquet and they don't have enough for the banquet. And to run out of wine in there, that was a disgrace because wine was the main blessing on the banquet, especially a wedding banquet. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. What's Jesus saying? This is not my banquet. It's not my wedding. My wedding banquet's to come. Jesus knows he's going to have his wedding banquet. The wine's not going to run out. But he's there as a guest at the banquet. It's not, it's not time for my banquet. I love his mum's response. Just do whatever he says. Well, what do you mean? What's he going to do? I don't know, but I know our Jesus. I can tell you now. He thinks he knows everything. If he tells you to do it, just do it. Don't reason, don't argue, just do it. Let's read down. Jesus has already said, but it's not my banquet. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used for Jews, ceremonial washing, each holding from 80 to 120 liters, 120 liters times six. That's a lot of liquid. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, the water that people have washed their feet with, toilet water. Right? Used for washing. So they filled them to the brim. Go on. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Look at the humility of Jesus here. It's not my banquet. Jesus is going to have a wedding banquet, but this wasn't it. He's just there as an honored guest. Jesus says, take it to the master of the banquet. You know, God, Jesus always does that. Jesus always follows proper protocol and authority. He doesn't follow all the um, legalistic traditions of men, but he always does what's right. Take it to, it's his banquet. Let him deal with it. So they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew... Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Next verse. What Jesus did here at Cana in Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. First miracle Jesus ever did was for the people at the banquet. Those who've been invited, 
those who'd been accepted, those who'd attended, those who had the right attitude, they did what he said, those who were doing the right things, everything who was in the right seats, everybody who was doing the right thing, got the miracle. Did you get that? God did the miracle at the banquet once everything was in place. And only God can do the miracle. You are at the banquet. You are at the Lord's table. We are coming to take bread and wine, but it's Jesus who does the miracle. If you just see a little bit of wine, this grape juice that you're going to drink, you're missing the point. As you pour it, as you drink it, God is doing the miracle. He is forgiving your sins and he is supplying all your needs according to his riches in Christ. God will do the miracle at the banquet. And if we abuse that, we actually end up with a curse like the Corinthians. Paul says some of you are getting sick and some of you are dying because you're abusing this banquet. You're misusing it. You're not recognizing the body. You're just trying to satisfy yourself. No, we are doing what Jesus says. We want the miracle. We want Jesus to turn the water into wine. We want it assimilated in us. The bread, we eat it. We're at the wedding banquet. You're getting the fullness of what God has for you. But you've got to be there. Some people didn't know what was going on. That's church every Sunday. Jesus is doing his greatest miracle up to that point, his first miracle. Most, some of the people didn't even know what was happening. The master of the banquet didn't know what was happening. Often the pastor's the last to know what's going on. God's doing a miracle in people's lives. I'm not aware of it. I'm just trusting God. I'm just pouring out the wine. I'm just bringing God's word. I'm just letting God speak to people. God's doing the miracle in you. The servants knew what was going on. The people running church didn't. I'm amazed at some of the miracles God does in people's lives, and I didn't even know it had happened. I've prayed for people who had not even known something was happened, and then found out weeks later God did a miracle. I'm the most amazed person around. Accept, attend, attitude, actions. Don't go to the alternatives. Assimilate it. Do you notice I've put them all in A's? Took me ages to do that. Because <laughs> apparently it helps you remember, but I don't think it does. So I, I, I usually don't do that. Last one then, and we're going to come to the table. And we're going to go back to what we said at the beginning. Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 4. We're at the banquet in the middle. We're remembering what God has done. We're looking forward to the banquet that God is going to bring. But now, let him lead me to the banquet hall. Go into the King James. He has brought me to the banqueting house. And his banner over me is love. Then it talks about giving the wine, staying me with, with, with flagons, a lot of wine, a lot of forgiveness, a lot of grace, a lot of love. He has brought you here. You're here now. You're at the banquet now. Final one then, number seven. Another A, you're accepted. You're accepted. You're adopted. God's not going to throw you out. You've accepted the garments of salvation. You're not the man who wasn't inappropriately dressed because you have faith in Jesus Christ. So you're accepted. You're in your seat at the wedding banquet. Next week, we're going to look at this in a more literal application. But understand you're at the banquet now. Can the team come up, please? We're going to worship the Lord and we're going to break bread and we're going to take the wine and we're going to remember what God has done at his banquet, what God is going to do at his banquet because we remember his death until he comes, past and future. 
but we're going to eat at his banquet right now. We're going to receive the blessing, the forgiveness of God. We're going to remember the new covenant in his blood. We're going to take the bread and we're going to take our seats at God's banqueting table. His banner over us is love and we're going to worship the Lord. The team is going to lead us in a song. Just stay where you are seated. Close your eyes and worship the Lord. And then we're going to take the bread and the wine. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you, team.